So if sugar's glucose, and that's what your mitochondria run on, then it's important to not necessarily demonize sugar, okay? If that's the fuel for your body, why do we demonize sugar? And I'm going to tell you why right now. Hello, this is Mike Musiolo, HBS practitioner in Santa Monica, California. I'm here to present to you a series of videos that are going to help cut through what's hype and what's not when it comes to exercise, nutrition, health, and everyday relevance. I want to remind everyone that none of the information in this video is meant to be taken as black and white medical or nutritional advice. We present the information, you do with it as you will. Today, we're going to be talking about sugar. Now, sugar has a lot of connotations with it, and some of these connot connotations in the spirit of tyranny of words aren't necessarily good ones. And we're here to kind of talk about why the demonization of sugar may not be justified. Here's the thing. Anything taken out of context is going to be bad, right? Or if you oversaturate with yourself with it, it's going to be bad. So what we want to think about is why sugar in particular context is actually good and why we don't have to frame on a larger theme, why we don't have to frame things as bad out of context, good or bad. Everything can be used as a tool in the correct context. So. In the spirit of tyranny of words, if you haven't read tyranny of words, I have a required reading up here, guys. So here's the thing. We're going to be going in depth in these videos. We want to go in depth so that way we can provide you with research supported, although research can be limited in some ways, it can be good. So research supported facts about certain subjects so that way we can put it through the lens of tyranny of words, sapiens, and for a little bit of a biology lesson, why zebras don't get ulcers. It's important to understand these, these books, guys. Do your homework. Don't be afraid to do your own homework. I'm going to be presenting this as well as I can, but the, but the fact of the matter is, if you guys take the time to read these three books, then you're gonna have a better understanding of how to view the world in a practical, concrete context. Tyranny of words is really the primary one because that's what really helps us get first principles thinking. First principles thinking hasn't really been popularized outside of the scientific field until relatively recently, actually. So when we talk about tyranny of words and we talk about first principles, we have to talk about the inferences that people make when we talk about sugar. When we talk about sugar, most people think ice cream, soda, syrups, processed foods, right? Luckily, nutritional information nowadays has evolved enough to where most people usually realize that ice cream, soda, a ton of soda with high fructose corn syrup, processed foods with grains, polyunsaturated fatty acids, things of that nature that usually hurts our digestion, hurts our metabolic system. Most people know that that's not good for you and it can lead to metabolic disease, which includes obesity and cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, which is a, can be, can be a, you can either be born with diabetes for a number of factors or you can develop diabetes later on. And that usually has to do with your insulin, but we're gonna get to that later. Let me backtrack once again. Tyranny of words, first principles, sugar. What comes to your brain when it comes to sugar? Ice cream, soda, syrup, processed foods, foods that are gonna make us heavy and fat. And what we have to kind of figure out is, does obesity cause metabolic disease? Does metabolic disease cause obesity? We have, in the spirit of functional patterns, we think of things as an integrated system. It is likely an inverse relationship between those two. So, sugar. Sugar is a carbohydrate, looking at the first principles. Sugar is a carbohydrate. What do we think of when we think of carbohydrates? Carbohydrates, we have simple carbs, we have complex carbs. We have fruit, we have baked goods, we have uh, vegetables, we have potatoes, we have all sorts of different forms of this macronutrient car carbohydrates, right? So we understand that some forms of carbohydrates are more efficient than others, but what happens is, we, carbohydrates is actually a big scapegoat too. Cause it's like, does car, is it sugar that causes metabolic disease? Or is it carbohydrates that cause metabolic disease, right? That's not something that's often thought about. When we think about sugar, 
we think about metabolic disease right away. But I believe that the truth is that an overconsumption of carbohydrates in general can still lead to weight gain and metabolic disease. You can't just eat as much, of you, as, as, much as you want of anything. That's just not the case. So carbohydrates, we've laid down the foundation of what carbo carbohydrates are. If we're really going to zone in on what sugar actually is, no matter what you want to call it, a carbohydrate, simple carbs, complex carbs, it's all going to be converted into your body's primary source of energy, which is glucose. Glucose is actually what's going to affect your insulin and blood sugar, okay? And, and even before that, guys, glucose is what your brain runs on. It's what powers your cells. It's what keeps your nervous system healthy. It's what really keeps you going. So you have to think, when we talk about you know, food is fuel. What we're really saying is food is glucose because it all gets broken down into that or anything that's a sugar or carbohydrate. And actually, technically, proteins can also be broken in, down into this as well. It's all going to be broken down into glucose. So glucose. Now we're getting into some abstract territory here. So let's see if we can define that. When we talk about glucose, we can't ignore blood sugar. And blood sugar is how much, how much glucose is actually floating around in your blood, right? And that's the thing that when we talk about blood sugar, in many instances, people think either hyperglycemic, hypoglycemic, or they refer to it in terms of diabetes. Because if you don't have metabolic disease, you don't usually even think about your blood sugar because you probably feel all right. Your metabolism's healthy. Your, th your body is fueled well. You probably have, you know, nice hair, skin, nails, things like that, right? If your cells are healthy. So if that's the case, then blood sugar gives us the idea of what it, or metabolic disease, diabetes, helps us give us an idea of what blood sugar is, okay? So that way we can kind of define it. And you can measure your blood sugar. That's something that can be objectively measured, okay? Now, when we talk about blood sugar, what spikes our blood sugar? And why do we care about that? When it comes to blood sugar, we have to talk about the glycemic index because that's directly relevant to met metabolic disease and diabetes. Because once you start having metabolic disease, then you start trying different diets, different ways to try and bring blood sugar at, to, a, to a stable level, okay? Because the glycemic index, which was invented in the, in the 1980s by Dr. Uh, Jenkins, that was used as a way to determine what's going to spike my blood sugar. Okay, and that's up here. We have a relative index, okay? So all these numbers are relative to each other. We have glucose, right? That's pure glucose, just straight up the molecule glucose. Then at the higher end of it, we have mostly baked goods. Now, this isn't necessarily just grains, right? There are lower glycemic grains, but it, what this is, what I'm drawing attention to here is that even whole wheat foods can be high on the glycemic index. And that's not even taking into account glycemic load. We'll get into that in a minute. But even these kind of like baked goods or grainy foods, right, will have a high blood sugar response from that. You'll have a high glycemic load from that. Then we have table sugar. Okay, table sugar is around 65. That's not that high. I would consider it about just below the high range. It's higher mid-range, right? But the thing about table sugar is too, is that if you have a tablespoon of table sugar, then that's only about 15 to 18 calories, right? You're gonna need to have quite a few spoonfuls of sugar to have the type of gly uh, glycemic spike th uh, that, that that would provide. Whereas if I have a whole bowl of pasta, my blood glucose is gonna go through the roof. So. Then there's fruit that's on the lower end, right? And so vegetables are on the lower end too, right? Things like that. And there are grains that are on the lower end. But I just want to draw your attention to fruit because fruit is in the 60s and below. And a lot of times people demonize fructose, which we're going to get into later. But fruit not only has, um, not only has uh, fiber to help blunt the 
uh, glycemic response, but it's also got all sorts of vitamins and, and nutrients in it, and it's very difficult to overeat fruit. So for the most part, okay? So fruit is on the lower end. So if we talk about having a blood sugar spike, when people are recommending whole grains, we have to consider that it's not necessarily sugar that's on the higher end all the time anyway, right? Because when we think of sugar, we sometimes think of fruit too, but it's about also the fact that we don't want, we don't want the blood sugar spike. So these foods can also spike your blood sugar, which is kind of, which is uh, not something that's often talked about. If you have glucose and you have your blood sugar, your blood sugar is how much glucose is in your blood. So if you're not using the glucose that's in your blood, then your insulin is going to store that in your liver and in your muscles. And then also, if that's full, it'll store it as fat which can, if you have too much fat, can lead to metabolic disease. That's why when we talk about the glycemic index, why we're trying to avoid foods that give you too much of a blood sugar spike. So if you were just to take straight glucose, that would be 100, you would have a high spike. If you were, supposed, if you were going to have white baked goods or just uh, white rice, for example, is one that causes a big insulin spike, Beer, right? Beer is a solid 89 on the glycemic index. So if you're pounding beers, guys, probably not so good for weight gain, metabolic disease, okay? Um, but you know, table sugar is only on the mid range. Fruit is on the lower range. Most fruit is around 40 or 50, so it's very low. And then there are some whole grain foods that are also 50s and below as well. However, let me go ahead and take a moment to direct you to the Functional Patterns website. If you haven't read the article on grains, that's extremely important to read because even though there are some lower glycemic index foods on the whole grain end, we don't necessarily recommend eating grains. And that article is going to tell you more about why we don't recommend it as a carbohydrate staple, as a primary fuel source, right? If anything, what I'm going to argue is that simple carbs are overall better than complex carbs. This is where everybody's gonna lose it. Everybody's gonna freak out. I said it, simple carbs are better than complex carbs. And there's reasons for that. Let's talk about one thing. What is a simple carb? It's a sugar molecule, right? Sugar is a carbohydrate, is a glucose. So it's basically a glucose molecule. Let's talk about complex carbs. Complex carbs are longer chains of of glucose molecules. That's why Tyranny of Words is such a good read, guys. The reason why I'm able to kind of just like put this together real quick, yes, I've done a bunch of studying on this, obviously, but the other part of it is, if you think about it in terms of the first principles, I'm literally talking about the molecular structure of your, of your body system, of your metabolism, of the food that you eat, the organic matter that you put in your mouth that's converted into the primary life source, glucose, then that is what, that, that when you have a hold of this, then you can do it on the fly. You can have an understanding of the way that even, even complex scientific principles work if you start from the first principles a lot. That's why we're doing these videos, guys. It's not just about sugar. It's about how you think. And if you wanna know how to think, then you have to do a little bit of homework. Don't be afraid to do it. Don't be the kid in class that didn't do their homework because you're gonna get left behind, okay? So, sugar, carbohydrates equals glucose equals blood sugar equals insulin, okay? Well, it doesn't equal insulin, but insulin is a hormone. You have to think about your hormonal health. Insulin is what is what uh, clamps down your blood sugar. It prevents it from getting too high. So it's gonna take the glucose that's in your bloodstream, it's gonna either fuel your muscles, it's gonna put it in your liver to store for later, or it's gonna put it as fat cells to store for later. And then if we get too much fat, we have too much metabolic disease. We pretty much establish that. The whole point of the glycemic index is that we have to think about starches. And starches, like we were talking about, are long chains of the molecule sugar. So if that's the case, then starches can lead to a higher glycemic response as well. So that's the thing, guys. A sugar is actually still a starch, which is actually glucose, okay? 
Now, I know I'm saying like that, like it's you know nutrition for dummies, but the reason I'm saying it like that is that no matter what you put into your body, it's going to be taken into glucose anyway. It's a little bit of that, uh, of that saying that a square's, a square's a rectangle, but a rectangle's not a square, right? And these semantic hip, hiccups happen all the time all the time. So if you haven't read Tyranny of Words, then I would recommend that because we have an appropriate referent. The word is not the thing. Sugar is not just table sugar, is not just fruit, is not just a starch, right? Sugar is ultimately glucose, okay? Which gets converted also to glycogen and glycogen is what's stored in your muscles and in your liver, and we'll be getting back to that later, okay? So I just wanted to mention that. But here's the thing too, I wanna talk about sapiens because sugar has this broad story associated with it, right? So if you read sapiens, what it talks about briefly is that humans tell stories, and humans tell stories on a broad, broad scale. And best case scenario, we have people who are trying to kind of lead the way with abstractions that don't that are nice to think about, but don't necessarily help very much. So we want to keep utilizing first principles along with globalized stories in order, in order for us to get on the same page about what actually matters in our shared objective reality. When we talk about glucose and we talk about uh, the glycemic index, we have to remember that it can be a flawed index. We have to remember that when we choose our foods, in some instances, I may want a higher glycemic response. I may need to replenish my blood sugar, right? Because you don't want your blood sugar to get too high, but you also don't want it to get too low. So remember that, generally speaking, if you stick to foods like fruit, we were talking about grains earlier, so check that out on functionalpatterns.com, but if you stick to mostly fruit and even white table sugar, maple syrup, orange juice, foods such as that, you're gonna be able to still have a lower blood sugar response. Not only that, you can also, you can also combine foods with a protein and a fat and if you do that, you have a balanced meal and that also keeps your blood sugar down. And that's very important as well because you wanna keep your blood sugar in a stable level because otherwise your stress hormones are gonna get out of whack. So this I have to bring attention to the fitness mantra of if you wanna lose weight, what do you do? You drop carbohydrates, okay? I drop carbohydrates, that's fair. I will probably let, become less heavy and possibly have less metabolic disease and my blood sugar won't be as high. But then we have to remember that our carbohydrates are is what is the glucose that fuels our body and brain. So if that's my primary fuel source and then I cut glucose, how long am I gonna be able to do that for without getting a significant stress response? Okay? So when it comes to your adrenal glands, your adrenal glands produce cortisol. And your cortisol is going to influence your stress response, right? And how high that is over a period of time, if you want to try and keep it low, then you're going to want to have balanced blood sugar. Okay? A balanced blood sugar equals an even release of cortisol, as opposed to a too high blood sugar, which releases cortisol, or too low of blood sugar, which releases cortisol. So the point is, you wanna keep your blood sugar even, and that's going to give you sustained cellular health and a sustained clear-headedness, right? If you want to maintain resilience to life stressors, you have to eat carbohydrates. There's no way around it. So if I cut carbohydrates, I'm trying. let's say I'm trying to lose weight, right? Fitness propaganda, I'm sorry to say it. Fitness propaganda is, Cut carbs, do a bunch of cardio, and you'll lose weight. Okay, but it's not necessarily that simple. Yes, for the most part, if you are obese, you will have to do caloric restriction in order to lose weight. But take somebody who already has a high level of chronic stress, 
a dysregulated metabolism, messed up digestion, tell them to cut carbs and tell them to do a whole bunch of cardio, and you are asking for metabolic dysregulation. Not only that, you can get low libido, skin health goes down, uh, they become, uh, they become, uh, they get brain fog, right? None of those things are what we're looking for when it comes to maintaining a, a high level of health and resilience. So you have to consider that sugar equals carbs equals glucose equals the primary thing that my brain runs on and the way to make my metabolism healthy. And if we cut, just blatantly cut carbohydrates, then we're not going to necessarily have a high functioning metabolism. I wanna mention one more thing about blood sugar, guys. If you exercise, exercising is what's going to help blunt your blood sugar response as well. Prime, when people exercise and they monitor their glucose, what they find is that their blood sugar doesn't spike as easily once they have their next post-workout meal. So if you have uh, really anything on this on this glycemic index, but you know we're, I'm recommending something like fruit or even straight table sugar over grains, it's not going to spike your blood sugar the same way. So when we talk about exercise, it's not just to lose weight. Um, or get metabolic benefits per se, you're gonna get metabolic benefits, but it also, when context of sugar, it's going to blunt your blood sugar response. So if you exercise, your blood sugar is gonna be more tolerant of carbohydrates for the most part and glucose, okay? Now, I wanna bring it to why zebras don't get ulcers, because why zebras don't get ulcers is a good uh, book to one, introduce you to Robert Sapolsky, which is, uh, who's a behaviorist and hormonal expert. Um, so get to know him. And then on top of that, with why zebras don't get ulcers, you're gonna understand why our bodies are not necessarily built for our modern day environment and how much our modern day environment uh, affects our stress response. Okay, so in order to understand more about your own biology, remember, this video series is not about just what should I eat, how should I exercise, what do I do, just tell me what to do. That's not what we're doing here. Regardless of any research supported this or scientific that, what matters is you learning through first principles how to think for yourself. This is actually what this whole video series is about. We're just using sugar to lay down the groundwork. Okay, so now we're gonna be transitioning from, you know, that talking about just sugar to talking about sugar in relationship to your metabolism, okay? Now, your metabolism is responsible for many things. We can talk about sugar without talking about your metabolism. I mentioned it here and there, but outside of glucose, you know, your blood sugar, your brain runs on glucose, your cells run on glucose, right? We have to understand our metabolism in order to understand more about biology and how, and here's the thing I wanna say about metabol metabolism, it's actually fascinating. It could possibly be the most complex chemical process on earth. So if we consider metabolism, it's gonna be complicated. You will never know everything, maybe not never, but more than likely you are not gonna know everything that there is to know about your metabolism, okay? Because it's so complicated. But I'm gonna break down some basics that helps lay the groundwork for future videos. It also helps in regards to sugar, and it helps with my justification as to why simple sugars are ultimately better than complex carbs. So here we go. Your metabolism is actually responsible for temper reg regulation. In many instances, people talk about metabolism and they think, it's usually talked about by, younger people don't talk about metabolism. It's usually older people who talk about metabolism, right? Older people talk about metabolism in the sense of when you get into your you know, mid 40s, oh, I wish I were young again so that way I could eat whatever I wanted. I had such a fast metabolism, right? But here's the thing. If we think about the root of what our metabolism is, it's actually a temperature regulator. So when it comes to how my body produces the heat that it needs to survive and the energy that it, heat is a waste product of the energy that we produce. So if that's the case, then you have to understand that you are actually an endothermic organism, okay? Now, I'm not trying to get too sciencey, but I just wanna, I want people to understand how your metabolism differs from other an animals. A reptile, 
is subjugated to its external environment in order to regulate its temperature. You are subjugated to your internal environment in order to regulate your temperature. So a really good way to check up on your metabolism, not the defining way, but a way, is to take your temperature. If you take your temperature first thing in the morning and it's at least 97 degrees or so, then you that, that's an indicator of a healthy metabolism. If you take it in the middle of the day, it should be around 98.6. If it's not, then that's, or if you get cold very easily, right? If you get cold very easily, if you don't have a lot of muscle mass, um, that is a sign of a dysregulated metabolism. So temperature regulation is a part of that. Then in or, when we talk about your metabolism, it's hard to talk about your metabolism without talking about your thyroid. So your thyroid is this little butterfly shaped gland that's uh, behind your throat, okay? Or like seated in your throat. And what, ha not in your throat, but you see what I'm saying. Your thyroid is here. So it's a butterfly shaped gland that's responsible for a lot of your hormonal health. That's why a lot of people call it the master gland, okay? So you can talk about thyroid health without understanding how that relates to carbohydrates. So carbohydrates in many instances are what give you a healthy thyroid. In other, what I mean by that is, remember when I was talking about carbohydrates and cutting them and having a stress response and how that is going to tank your hormones and cause uh, a spike in cortisol, which leads to a high stress response. That stress response is going to eventually dysregulate your thyroid health. And when that happens, little do people know, your thyroid is not just responsible for, you know, a lot of, you know, the stereotype is particularly women, when they get into their later, late 30s, early 40s, late 40s, they start saying, oh, you know, I'm gaining weight because my thyroid's out of whack. And then on top of that, they start, you know, um, it, cutting carbohydrates and doing a bunch of cardio. And then that increases their stress response, which becomes a, you know, cataclysmic cycle of metabolic dysregulation. Your thyroid is interlinked to your metabolism as well. Your thyroid is this butterfly shaped hormone that sits about right here in your body. And what that does is it's the conductor of every metabolic process. So because it's the conductor of everybody, every metabolic process, what people don't understand is that actually thyroid dysregulation can be a, uh, can be a contributor to many diseases. So many of these metabolic syndromes are interlinked to an unhealthy thyroid. And we're gonna get into why we recommend having simple sugars in order to have good thyroid health because you want your body to be a furnace, okay? You don't want it to be a lukewarm microwave oven. You want it to be a furnace. You want it to burn off waste products in the form of heat, okay? And if you have a dysregulated thyroid, that's why people who have a dysregulated thyroid, their body temperature is lower. Most of the time they gain weight, not in every, every instance, but they have a sluggish metabolism. And if you have a sluggish metabolism, then you're not gonna be able to regulate your body temperature well. Aside from that, it also helps with the regulation of your immune system. So if that's the case, guys, the regulation of your immune system, your metabolism, once again, back to fitness propaganda, you cut carbs, you start exercising as frequently as you can, you start training for triathlons, you start doing weightlifting. It, here's, a, here's a common occurrence that has happened to me in my life. When I used to do heavy weight training, heavy squats, heavy deadlifts, heavy bench press, what I would notice is that if something was going around, this is anecdotal, but if something was going around, a cold or a flu, and that my body was recovering and I was very sore, in many instances, I would get sick because my immune system was not functioning as well as it should because my metabolic process to try to help my muscles recover from being so sore was actually down. So here's the funny thing, guys. Fitness propaganda, eat less, exercise more, eat less, exercise more, it doesn't always work that way. Those fitness influencers that you see on Instagram with 2% body fat may not be as healthy as you think. Somebody who is, so you know, a lot of people we're talking about over these past two years, seemingly extremely healthy people will still get sick. And if that's, that happens because when you're overtraining and not rationing your metabolism, 
then you are going to have a weakened immune system. And you have to be very particular about the stress that you put under your body because that affects your metabolism, which affects your immune system, which affects your health as a whole. So you have to think about these types of things, guys, okay? So another thing when it comes to immune system I have to mention here is that now we have to get into published research. I'm gonna name one study right off the top here by the National Institute of Health, talking about how autoimmune disorders are on the rise. We have more information available at our fingertips than ever before. If that's the case, why are autoimmune disorders up? Okay, because here's the thing too, when it comes to your immune system, your metabolic health, it is also related to your gut health, right? So if your gut health is related to your metabolism, related to your immune system, could that be an indicator as to whether, whether why autoimmune disorders are going up? This incredibly vague diagnosis that your body is attacking itself essentially, right? There are so many different types of autoimmune disorders and we literally don't know anything about it to really help it, okay? So, and if we did, and the only reason I'm saying that, I'm not an absolute expert on autoimmune disorders, but what I can say is that if we knew what we were doing, they would be going down as opposed to up. Aside from, autoimmune disorders going up. We also have obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and then I just threw in knee and hip replacements in here as well, are all going up. They are not going down. So I just have to kind of call out people who are get really upset when we talk about different strategies than what we're currently doing in order to change public health and they get super upset about that it's not what they're currently doing or it's different from what they're currently doing or it's different from what mainstream health institutions are talking about. And what I say is that mainstream health institutions get things wrong and we are not doing the right things because public health metrics are in the toilet and that's the truth of it. So here's the deal guys, talking about research overall, I'm gonna take a quick segue from metabolism. Metabolism, temperature regulation, thyroid health, immune system, stress regulation. Your metabolism matters. It's a complex chemical progress, uh, chemical process that regulates almost everything in your body. That's what we're talking about here. So besides your metabolism, so when people look for things to make choices about how to influence their metabolism, they talk about published research, okay? I'm not saying that, pub, that all, research is good. Research is not bad, right? What I have to draw our attention to is that research has its drawbacks. Research has its limitations. And many people will say, a lot of health gurus, a lot of influencers will say, okay, well, we never said that research didn't have its limitations. Yes, but you didn't point out what they are. So I'm gonna do that now. Confounding variables of most published research. One, many of them are just untrue, just false, just outright wrong, okay? Now, I'm, I'm not trying to throw it under the bus. We need scientific research for things. I wanna direct your attention to a study done by John P. A. Ioannidis, okay? And it's titled, Why Most Published Research is False, okay? Now, that doesn't mean all published research is false. That doesn't mean that research supported strategies are bad, but it's important to recognize that most published research is unable to be replicated. Huge problem. Independent replication is a enormous part of good science. You may remember an older tyranny of words video. If I have, this is a whiteboard marker, if I take this marker and drop it, it falls. Every single time it will fall, no matter what I do. Now, it may not fall this next time. This next time that I drop it, it may not fall, but the probability of it falling is pretty much 100%, okay? 
If I can't, that's an example of, of an objective measurement that we can repeatedly measure. Now, that's a very simple experiment, right? Do we need elaborate research studies in order to determine things that matter? Yes. However, if we can't replicate them, then that's a problem, okay? Another issue is that it's not, most of them are not longitudinal studies. So if they're not longitudinal studies, then how do we, especially with the human body, how do we know whether or not, if we say, here's a good example, polyunsaturated fatty acids, okay? Reason why I'm bringing that up is because polyunsaturated fatty acids could be influenced by, could cause metabolic dysregulation, okay? So here's where I'm gonna go with that because I know what you're thinking. All of the studies on PUFAs say they, the American Heart Association recommends having, you know, uh, not only fish oils, but veggie oils, right? And I say veggie oils because, ew, veggie oils, no way. American Health Association, there is no way that you can tell me that cooking and sucking down canola oil is healthy for me. In order to talk about that more, I encourage you to look up the, uh, the work of Ray Peet. Ray Peet. This is a guy that is a biophysicist, PhD, with a specialty in endocrinology and hormone health. Okay, And he, a lot of these nutritional tenets come from Ray Peet. The reason why I like Ray Pete and why in many instances functional patterns recommends a lot of, nobody has it all figured out, but recommends the, the tenets of, of the nutritional pro protocols is because he recognizes, he uses research to support the articles that he writes and the rec recommendations that he makes, but he always recognizes the shortcomings of scientific research. And he has a really strong hold on cellular biology and the chemical processes that happen in your body and your metabolism. And he's also not afraid to cite conflicting research, okay? So that's the, another thing with research studies that in many instances, they confirm biases, okay? They confirm biases, right? So we've gone through the confounding variables. And just remember, guys, these past couple of years, I understand it's the information wars. We gotta have reputable information, but be careful with credentialism, okay? High level educational institutions, health institutions, mainstream institutions get things wrong all the time, all the time. And the reason that is, is because that's real science. You will never know everything there is to do. You will never know everything there is to know. You will never do everything there is to do. And everything that is evolved is throughout time will always change. No two moments in time are the same. You have to understand that there are always going to be, at least at this moment in time, confounding variables with research. Another thing about PUFAs, because PUFAs is possibly a huge confounding variable when it comes to metabolic health. A lot of people want to blame sugar, but PUFAs actually likely contribute to metabolic dysregulation and other uh, causes of mortality as well. I want to direct your, and then here's an example about longitudinal studies. There's a study that was done um, a while back, and we'll link that study, and it was done at the LA uh, Veterans Hospital. And what they did was they followed uh, a, gr a control group, an experimental group, for almost 10 years. They did it for about eight years. And one group ate saturated animal fats, and one group consumed mostly vegetable oils. What they found was that most of the metrics in terms of all-cause mortality were the same until the eighth year. The eighth year, all-cause mortality in the veggie oil group started to go up. And then they ended the study, which is kind of weird, but probably due to a lack of funding. So the deal with that is, guys, that's an example. What they wrote at the end of it was, for the conclusion, they would have you would have to have at least a decade to determine whether or not vegetable oils cause more 
uh, like drive up all cause mortality. So if that's the case, then that's an example of why most studies need, on humans need to be longer than a decade in many instances in order to determine whether or not it has negative consequences to your health. Ray Pete has been quoted saying that you need 50 years in order to really tell whether or not a human being is going to respond negatively or positively to whatever stimulus that you provide it. Now, are we gonna run studies that last for 50 years? Maybe in the future, I'm not sure. What I'm saying is, as far as I know at this moment in time, I have not read any other PUFA study that's much longer than six to 10 weeks. And those initial cardiovascular benefits, you can't know whether or not in the long term that that's going to end up harming your health and be a contributing factor to metabolic dysregulation. If PUFAs, this is from the research of Ray P, if research have to are a contributing aspect of insulin resistance, then they could be a huge confounding variable with the problematic metrics of public health. A huge confounding variable. We'll be doing a whole other video on polyunsaturated fatty acids, but just understand that these things could be interrelated. Another thing that related that they're related to is mitochondrial dysfunction. So when we talk about mitochondrial dysfunction, your cell, your, we have to define what mitochondria are. So for the sake of saving space, I'm going to make a little mitochondria right here. Okay, so just pretend that this is a mitochondria, okay, and this is a part of your cell. And your cell is your body's powerhouse. You can think of it as your engine. And your mitochondria, produce, when it's running well, it actually produces waste products in the form of heat, which once again is why your metabolism is a temperature regulator. You want your mitochondria to produce heat in your cells so that way you're, you have energy throughout the day. And guess what? Your mitochondria run on glucose. And glucose is sugar. So if sugar is glucose and that's what your mitochondria run on, then it's important to not necessarily demonize sugar, okay? If that's the fuel for your body, why do we demonize sugar? And I'm going to tell you why right now. It's because of the molecule fructose, and that's the molecule that's found in fruit sugar, okay? Now it's also, what's not as well known is that it's also found in table sugar. And table sugar is basically 50-50 uh, fructose and glucose, okay? So table sugar is sucrose, which is 50-50 glucose and fructose. And then fruit sugar, fructose, the, the, the sugar found in fruit also has fructose, but in much lesser amounts. So here's the deal. When it comes to fructose, there's conflicting research on it. And a lot of people think that because fructose is in table sugar, and it's metabolized the same way as high fructose corn syrup, and high fructose corn syrup is bad for you, then all sugar must be bad for you. But that's just not, there's a lot of confounding variables there, so let's break down a couple of them. One, high fructose corn syrup usually comes in processed foods with a lot of additives, and usually they're in grainy foods as well, right? Pop-Tarts has high fruct fructose corn syrup, um, you know, lots of candies and chocolate candies have high fructose corn syrup that are loaded with av additives. They literally have tens, 10 to 20, 30 ingredients on every label, right? So that's a confounding variable. Another confounding variable from the work of Ray Pete is what was found is that high fructose corn syrup actually had a higher carbo carbohydrate load in the food that it was in uh, as opposed to what the nutritional label said. So if you have, because here's the thing, in the obesity pandemic, kids are getting heavier and heavier as well. There are more obese kids nowadays than there were in the 1950s. And a contributing factor to that is likely soda. So loaded with high fructose corn syrup, soda can be ingested in large amounts. And when they ingest all that liquid uh, high fructose corn syrup, and then on top of that, it might have a higher carbohydrate load than what's listed on the label. 
I mean, of course they're going to gain weight, right? But that doesn't mean that sugar, table sugar, is bad. There have been studies showing that it's metabolized the same way, but ultimately, once again, confounding variables when it comes to scientific research, if you are in control of how much sugar is in the food that you eat, remember a spoonful of sugar, a whole tablespoon of sugar is only 15 to 18 calories, then that's not going to be the same glycemic load as chugging a whole soda, okay? Or eating a bunch of processed food, okay? That's not what we're looking for when it comes to sugar. And then here's the thing, a lot of people get confused. Is the sugar in fruit as detrimental as what, or perceiving, well, as detrimental as processed, fruit, uh, processed sugar? So people will say, oh, here's fruit, here's processed food. Are they the same? And the answer is no. Fruit, of course, has fiber that's gonna blunt your blood sugar response, and there is likely a uh, molecular structural difference between something like fruit and something like processed candy. Now, there was a recently a meme about DK Metcalf, not a meme, but I think it was some sort of, uh, some sort of ad or interview. It was an interview with DK Metcalf talking about how he eats two or three bags of candy a day. Two or three bags of candy a day would be insane for somebody that's not a, an athlete, right? But DK Metcalf can get away with it. Why? Because he has a high blood sugar tolerance because he's exercising all the time. So remember, your liver and your muscles store glycogen. So because he's constantly depleting his glycogen, he probably could get away with eating even processed high fructose corn syrup and just candy in general. Perhaps he's eating candy with organic cane sugar, right? There may not be a huge molecular difference between the two though, though guys. So because that's the case, most people that uh, endocrinologists, they demonize fructose in general. So when we talk about fructose, that's the reason another why, why table sugar is demonized, but there are studies back to the work of Ray Pete talking about how uh, sugar can have a thermogenic effect. So if it has a thermogenic effect and you want your mitochondria to produce heat, then a spoonful or two of table sugar might actually be helpful for giving yourself a metabolic boost. So if you want a metabolic boost, you might wanna try a tablespoon or two of sugar. Am I saying that everybody's gonna to respond to that the same way? No, what I'm saying though is that the verdict is still out. It is not absolutely known that just table sugar or fruit sugar, fructose alone, is the ultimate contributing factor to the obesity pandemic and the, up, the uprising of metabolic syndrome. Remember, starches are long chain, um, long chain sugar molecules. It is much easier to overeat starches and a lot of foods will also have polyunsaturated fatty acids. So guys, remember, there's a lot of confounding variables here. It's not just sugar. And we have to understand sugar in context of the big picture of what my cells run on to utilize at, in order, as a resource in order to keep me alive, in order to keep my stress levels down, in order to maintain resilience to life stressors. If you think about the first principles of metabolic health and build it up from there, then you won't demonize isolated variables out of context in order to make more well-informed decisions. So that's going to wrap up today's video. We're going to be doing more on the series, talking about scientific research, talking about metabolic health, talking about nutrition, talking about all the protocols outside of your exercise methodology that's going to bring you good health. Most importantly, it's going to teach you how to think and looking through the lens of first principles is really the most important part of this video series. So check out the required reading, and this is Mike Musiolo reminding you to think intentionally and not habitually.